Hello everybody. In this class, we are going to deal with the unification of Italy that occurred in two steps. The first step was in 1861 and the unification was finally achieved in 1870. This is part of the contents of unit number three. So let's start, but before starting, I would like to tell you that there is uh, a resemblance between the unification of Germany and Italy in uh, the political organization because we said that in Germany Prussia was the most important state with a king and a prime minister and the same happened in Italy. I will let you know. First of all, I would like to talk about the system of government in the present Italy. Italy has a president and also a prime minister whose technical name is the president of the Council of Ministers, but he is known as the prime minister. Uh, weirdly, the president and the prime minister are not elected by people. Italian citizens vote for the members of the Chamber of Deputies and the Chamber of Senate. That is to say, it is a uh, bicameral system uh, with deputies and senators. They are the ones uh, elected by the people, by the enfranchised Italian at the age of 18. That is the only requirement to cast a vote in Italy. The system of government is a democratic republic. Italy has been a democratic republic since June 2nd, uh, 1946, in the middle of World War II, when Mussolini was uh, overthrown. So, we have the president. Who elects the president? The president is elected by a college composed by deputies and senators, and it is the president who elects the prime minister with the support and the authorization of the parliament. There is also a judicial system uh, whose head is the president because the president is the head of the republic. So this is information for you to know, to compare and to have a general culture as regards the government in Italy. Let's start with the content of the unification of Italy. This was Italy in 1815. Why do I highlight the year 1815? Because it was the year in which the Congress of Vienna was held. Remember that the Congress of Vienna was held after the downfall of Napoleon. And as you can see, there are different colors and different states. We have the Kingdom of Sardinia uh, with Cagliari as the capital. Uh, also, uh, Turin and Genoa were part of the Kingdom of Sardinia, the most important kingdom in Italy or in these states was Sardinia. Then uh, Lombardy, Venezia, Parma, Modena in the north, Tuscany and the Papal States in the center, and the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies with Palermo and Naples in the south. This was Italy before unification. As I did with uh, Germany and France, I am going to explain uh, some pictures before we start. And some important people for the unification of uh, Italy. Uh, this is uh, Giuseppe Mazzini. This one, one of the most important men in the unification of Italy. He can be compared to Otto von Bismarck in the unification of Germany because uh, he was shrewd and intelligent. He didn't follow diabolical steps as for example Otto von Bismarck but he was very intelligent. Giuseppe Garibaldi. Garibaldi was a romantic. He was a, a member of the army. He was a retired military who came back from retirement for the unification of Italy. We also are going to talk about our friend, yes, our friend Louis Napoleon Bonaparte. He was involved also in the unification of Italy. He played a very important role. Why did he want the unification of Italy? Not at all. 
He wanted to prevent at all cost Italy from being unified, but he failed. We are going to talk about religion and the Papal States, and this is the picture of Pius IX, who was the Pope at the time of uh, Italian unification in 1870. And finally, the first king of the unified Italy, Victor Emmanuel II, who was the last king of uh, Sardinia and the first king of the unified Italy. These people played very important roles in the unification of Italy. Now let's talk about the historical context in 1848. If you remember, in 1848, in, in, in Europe, there was a series of revolutions, the most important one, the uh, February Revolution in France. We talked about that. Uh, at that time, in 1848, we can say that Italy was a patchwork of petty states, that is to say, unimportant states. They, they, they didn't have any importance at all. Sardinia, the Papal States, and the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies were the states, uh, the independent states. This is very important to remember, they were independent. The kingdom of Sardinia was in the north, um, the north, and also it was an island, as I told you. The Papal States in the central region, and the kingdom of the two Sicilies in the south. But as I told you before, there was a, there was a series of petty states. For example, Lombardy and Venetia, they used to be republics. They were independent, but they were defeated by Austria, and they were incorporated to the territories of Austria. And some other uh, kingdoms, the Kingdom of Tuscany, Parma and Modena, had rulers who respond, responded sorry, to the Habsburgs, who were the dynasty uh, of, were the, the members of the dynasty in Austria. So most of the territories of Italy before unification belonged to Austria. Don't forget about that, because in this way, we are going to come back to talk about Otto von Bismarck. Let's continue with the historical content, content uh, or context, sorry. The old governments that we mentioned were unpopular. Which were the governments we mentioned? Venetia, Tuscany, Modena, the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, the Papal States, all of them were unpopular, except for Sardinia. Why wasn't Sardinia unpopular? Simply because Sardinia had a king at that time, the king was Charles Albert, and he had uh, different people who advised him, and one of them was Camillo di Cabur, someone we are going to talk about in a few minutes. So Sardinia took the lead, if you remember, in Germany, Prussia took the lead. How did Prussia take the lead? Remember, through uh, a series of reforms that paved the way for democracy. Well, this was Charles Albert, and also he uh, paved the way for the coming of democratic reforms. Uh, there was a constitution and a parliament. And in the constitution, there was a bill of rights. So people who lived in Sardinia were happy because their rights were respected, or at least they thought their rights were respected. While in the other uh, kingdoms, the people did not have the same rights and the governments were uh, utterly unpopular. So that is why Sardinia took the lead, because the democratic reforms were being imposed in that kingdom. And with uh, this, um, uh, as I told you before, this system of uh, states and Sardinia is the most important one, we have to talk about a movement called the Risorgimento. There is a cartoon here uh, in which some important people that we have already mentioned at the beginning of the, this presentation are represented in this cartoon. It was soon discovered that the Italians were more interested in nationalism than in democracy. This became evident 
because um, they were not uh, worried about rights, but they wanted to come back to the time in which Italy was the leading country in Europe. When was that time? Were two important moments in history. The first one, the times of the Roman Empire, and the second, uh, more recently, at, until that time, which was the Renaissance or Renaissance. So they wanted Italy to come back to the glories of these of those days. So this movement, Risorgimento, uh, meant the resurrection of the Italian spirit, which would restore the nation to the position of glorious leadership it had held in ancient times, as I told you, with the Roman Empire and during the age of the Renaissance. Obviously, that is the, the difference between the Italian unification and the German unification. Uh, in this case, the Italians were more interested in a uh, nation, in the glory of the nation. And in the Risorgimento, we are going to talk about three important men. Giuseppe Garibaldi, Mazzini and Camillo di Cavour. The one who is completely different from uh, the rest is Camillo di Cavour. Because Giuseppe Garibaldi and Mazzini, well... Uh, maintained some resemblance. For example, Garibaldi was located in the south of Italy and he was a military. At the time of the Risorgimento, he was retired, but he came back from retirement to start a campaign from the south to the north, uh, a military campaign in order to unify Italy. Giuseppe Mazzini was not that different. He was a rebel, yes, because uh, he was part of a secret organization called the Carbonari. Uh, he, this uh, secret organization wanted uh, to overthrow the Austrian government in the different kingdoms in Italy through revolutions. Uh, he participated in revolutions in 1820 and in 1830. And if you remember, in 1830 in France, there was the July Revolution. Well, it also happened in Italy. The main objective was to put down or to overthrow the Austrian <coughs> governments in the Italian uh, kingdoms. But this uh, secret organization, the Carbonari, uh, was defeated by the Austrians. So, uh, this... Uh, organization was not successful. Uh, Mazzini was very intelligent at speaking. He, after the Carbonari, he formed a society called Young Italy. He urged people to revolt and expel foreign kings. He was uh, very capable because he had the ability to stir people with speeches and writings but he was not successful at all. The one who was completely different, as I told you, was Camillo di Cavour. He was far more practical. He didn't think in a revolution, but he thought how to expel the Austrians from Italy without a revolution or without a direct war, because he knew that uh, Sardinia, his kingdom, was not would not be able to defeat the powerful Italian army. So, remember this, please. Garibaldi and Mazzini had some resemblance, but they were different from Camillo di Cavour. And at this time, in the Risorgimento, there were three types of government that people thought about. That is to say, that these uh, leaders thought for Italy. The young idealist, uh, led by Giuseppe Mazzini, for example, uh, wanted uh, Italy to be a republic. Yes, to achieve this, of course, it was universally agreed that Italy must uh, be joined in a single state. So, they wanted Italy to be a republic. There was uh, a different uh, group also, they, they 
called religious-minded patriots who believed that the most practical, practicable solution would be to federate the states of Italy under the presidency of the Pope, yes, the Pope, because he was the head of the Papal States. The majority of the moderate nationalists advocated a constitutional monarchy, and under this category or under this thought, we can incorporate Camillo di Cavour, because this constitutional monarchy had to be built upon the foundations of the Kingdom of Sardinia, because Sardinia was the most uh, important state and one of the independent states of Italy at that time. So let's begin with the uh, campaign for unification of Italy. It was, as I told you before, that uh, the main uh, step they had, or the first step Italy had to take, was to expel the Austrians from the different kingdoms they domina dominated. Remember the uh, former republics of uh, Venetia. Uh, also remember that there were some territories dominated by the Habsburgs, who were members of the Austrian dynasty. So in order to unify Italy, it was necessary that uh, Italians uh, expelled the Austrians from their territories. But it was soon uh, proved that that was going to be an impossible task. Why was it going to be impossible? Because the, the army, uh, that is to say the Austrian army was very powerful and it was not possible for the Italian army or the Sardinian army to defeat this uh, powerful army. So this is when we are going to compare Camillo di Cavour with Otto von Bismarck. Well there are some letters missing there, sorry. Because uh, Camillo di Cavour decided to organize a diplomatic plan in order to expel the Austrians, not by means of revolutions of, of war, but by means of diplomacy and some secret arrangements. Continuing with the campaign for unification in Italy, we are going to talk about shrewdness and Camillo di Cavour. They go or they went hand in hand. So, as I told you before, um, Cavour turned out to be less heroic but more practical than the other members of this movement of the Risorgimento. In 1855, yes, 1855, in order to attract the favorable attention of Great Britain and France, he entered a war. That, was, that war was the Crimean War. It was a war against Russia, that is to say, a war in which Great Britain and France fought against Russia. Why? Because Russia wanted to incorporate the Ottoman Empire uh, to the possessions of Russia, and this was very dangerous for France and for uh, Great Britain. So, uh, when nobody understood why Sardinia, with uh, Sardinia, Sardinia is in Spanish, Sardinia entered the war, nobody understood why Camillo di Cavour entered the Crimean War. But he was preparing the stage for the unification of Italy. Because uh, he entered the Crimean War on the side of Great Britain and France in order to uh, gain some sympathy from those countries. At the same time, uh, three years later, in 1858, he had a secret meeting with Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, remember? Napoleon III, and uh, he promised Napoleon that if he helped uh, uh, Sardinia to expel the Austrians, Sardinia would give two important territories to France, Savoy and Nice. And as you know, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte was very ambitious and he accepted yeah, Napoleon III accepted and he started uh, to help with his army um, the uh, Camillo di Cavour to expel the Austrians. If you remember, I told you that Camillo di Cavour 
realized that for his army it was impossible to defeat Austria. That is why he made a secret arrangement with Napoleon, with Louis Napoleon Bonaparte. But what happened? Everything uh, finished in a failure for Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, but benefited Italy in this process of unification. Why? Because the war, the war, uh, that is to say the war that Napoleon carried out in Italy to expel the Austrian, was not a short one. It was very, very long, and his troops, the French troops, started to be uh, weaker and weaker. So he decided to leave. He decided to abandon the war. But that was good news for Camillo di Cavour because uh, Italy or uh, Sardinia was not going to give uh, Nice and Savoy to Napoleon III. And this good news was extended because Italy, until the time Napoleon had left the war against Austria in Italy, Italy had annexed Lombardy, while the duchies of Tuscany, Parma and Modena, which remember were dominated by the Habsburg, uh, were uh, incorporated to Sardinia. So Sardinia as Prussia in Germany became bigger and bigger, more and more powerful. Besides the northern section of the Papal States, remember the Papal States which were dominated by the Pope, voted in an outburst of nationalism for the union with Sardinia. So Sardinia was now more than twice of her original size and by far was the most powerful state in Italy. So this is very important to remember. As well, as we say, when Napoleon III withdrew the war, uh, Sardinia had gained uh, different territories, the northern section of the Papal States, also Tuscany, Parma, Modena, Lombardy. So it was the biggest state and uh, it was, uh, ac according to Camillo di Cavour, the time for the final unification of Italy. Which were the steps for the unification? Well, the states that joined Sardinia that I already mentioned uh, also uh, had the same characteristic that they were in, in the central part of uh, Italy and in the northern section. But what happened in the south? The south of Italy was dominated by the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. The Kingdom of the Two Sicilies were uh, dominated or had as the king Francis II. Francis II was a very unpopular king in the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. He was thoroughly hated by uh, his Italian subjects because he responded to the Austrians. So it was time to overthrow Francis II in order to unify uh, Italy because Italy was unified in the north but the problem was in the south. It happened the same in Prussia. Do you remember the southern states were the last ones in incorporating to the uh, unification of Germany? In this case, it was practically the same, but the method was completely different. Here is when uh, Giuseppe Garibaldi uh, started to appear as the very important man to win, um, that is to say, the uh, battles in the south of Italy against Francis II and the Austrians for the unification of Italy from the south. Giuseppe Garibaldi and the 1000 Red Shirts, it was the name of his army. So Giuseppe Garibaldi, as I told you, with the Red Shirts, in a period of three months, conquered the island of Sicily and marched to uh, Naples, where the people were already in revolt, so it was easier for him. By November, the whole kingdom of Francis II had fallen uh, into the hands of Giuseppe Garibaldi. So Garibaldi realized that he was very powerful at that time. So he started to think, do I make the kingdom of the two Sicilies an independent country 
under my leadership. But remember, the Italians were more interested in the greatness of the nation rather than in democracy or individual uh, uh, power. That is to say, Garibaldi at first apparently intended to convert the territory into an independent republic, but he was finally persuaded to surrender it to the kingdom of Sardinia. So all of the sudden, Sardinia had taken the north, the center, and the south. But there were some territories that still had not been incorporated to Italy. So when uh, this uh, kingdom of the two Sicilies uh, was given or was surrendered or was offered to Sardinia, uh, the peninsula, the Italian peninsula, was united under a single ruler. Victor Emmanuel II, the king of Sardinia, assumed the title of king of Italy. This happened on March 17, 1861. So that is the first date or the first year of the unification of Italy. The almost all, all Italy was unified under a single king, who was Victor Emmanuel II, and of obviously um, Camilo di Cavour as the prime minister. But there were, as I told you, some territories which still did not belong to Italy. Yeah, that was the first unification, as I told you. So, which were the final steps for the unification? The Austrian-Prussian War. Do you remember the Austrian-Prussian War? Do you remember that Otto von Bismarck wanted to play the role of victim when he didn't give the territories of Schleswig and Holstein to Austria in the process of unification of Germany? And that is why, well, he uh, made a secret arrangement with the Kingdom of Sardinia. He defeated the Austrians and Venetia was recovered by Sardinia. So Venetia was incorporated to this process of unification in Italy. Well, now the Franco-Prussian War. Why is it important with our friend Louis Napoleon Bonaparte? The, the only step, or the only step, sorry, that uh, was not achieved was the incorporation of Rome. That is to say, the capital of Italy. The capital of Italy had not been annexed yet. The city had resisted the conquest for, yes, far largely because of the military protection accorded to the Pope by Napoleon III. Napoleon III had made an arrangement with the Pope and he gave the Pope uh, security, yes, uh, protection, and, well, uh, he had some rights and some important uh, uh, prerogatives in that papal states. So the papal states belonged to the Pope, but were protected by Napoleon III. Where were the, these states in Rome, which is the capital of Italy? So why did the Franco-Prussian War play an important role in this aspect? When the Franco-Prussian War started, and Otto von Bismarck uh, yeah, began to defeat Napoleon troops, the troops that Napoleon III had in Rome had to go to France. So Rome was unprotected. And when Rome was unprotected, Giuseppe Garibaldi, who came from the south, took that opportunity to uh, conquer Rome and to incorporate Rome for the final process of unification in Italy. But there was still another problem in Italy. The problem was the Papal States. The occupation of Rome brought the Kingdom of Italy into conflict with the Papacy. Why? Because the whole movement, remember liberalism, the young liberals, for the unification of Italy, had been characterized by opposition to the Church. So. There were some, some, most of the Catholics were not so glad uh, and, the, and the clergy, of course, were completely unhappy uh, because of this process of unification which was carried out by these young liberals.
As Garibaldi was completely decided to unify Ger uh, sorry, Italy, well, as one another of these states was annexed, monasteries were gradually closed and much of the property which belonged to the church was confiscated and given to the poor. So the papacy was not uh, happy at all. The problem was solved by the Italian parliament in 1871 uh, they enacted the law of papal guarantees, uh, giving uh, the, the Pope uh, the title of the, 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 the sovereign in the Vatican. So he was to be granted full authority over the Vatican, and it is even nowadays that the Vatican, which is in Rome, is an independent state. Besides, uh, it was decided that the government of Italy, the new government, had to pay an annual indemnity of about six hundred and forty five thousand dollars yes annual that is to say annually that is to say uh, this um, amount of money was to be given to the papacy uh, the Pope was Pius IX in 1870 and obviously in 1871 but uh, he denounced uh, these issues because they affected the Pope and the papacy and uh, he decided to uh, that is to say to be in, in the Vatican he was uh, quarantined in that uh, territory he didn't have any relationship with uh, the government and this uh, finished with Mussolini in uh, 1945 with Pius the 11th that finally um, we went out from that lockdown, from that quarantine, and appeared again, and the papacy uh, regained, uh, that is to say, the power the papacy had. But the Vatican is the only territory that could not be annexed to Italy. In fact, the Vatican and the Pope are so powerful that they are independent state they are an independent state in a unified country as italy so italy remember was unified in 1871 finally in 1870 sorry finally before it had been unified with some territories in 1861 when uh, the king was victor emmanuel ii and the prime minister was camilo di cavour the term of cavour in the government was just six months then uh, in 1870 the final unification there was another prime minister well this was uh, the unification the process for unification of Italy see you next class uh, I I think that we are going to meet after winter holidays so uh, because you have uh, you need time to study for final exams but at the same time you will have time to organize your material in this subject see you bye bye